I'm ready to go to the desert because deserts are extremely cool and they're some of my favorite areas in video games and just like in general in terms of an ecosystem. Like, did you know that desert sand is some of the most fertile land on Earth? I mean, that, that statement's a little bit misleading. It's, it's more like the sands of the desert have a very high concentration of minerals that plants really like. If you add a little bit of organic matter and some water, your plants will grow like gangbusters. In fact, fine sand from the Sahara Desert gets blown across the ocean and deposited in the Amazon rainforest like some kind of natural fertilizing system. It's like 27,000 tons of sand per year. It's nuts! But these kinds of things make me wonder. If sand is good fertilizer for forests, then why would Ruka Devada build the Wall of Samuel to, quote, keep out the sandstorms? Wouldn't the sandstorms be beneficial to the growth of the forest, like, technically? Really makes you wonder if she might have had another reason for that wall, a reason which we will explore at length in this video along with several other small theories based on the version 3.1 livestream and teaser trailer. Are y'all ready to get some sand in uncomfy places? No? Just me? Okay then, that's, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Obviously, a track to the desert means more Scarlet King lore, or should I say, King Deshret lore. Adia starts us off by talking about the Wall of Samuel, a wall supposedly built to keep out the sandstorms and thus prevent deforestation, which I guess I kind of buy, but it's also a wall supposedly to keep out the people of the desert. But it can't be a super magic wall or anything, otherwise the Eremites wouldn't actually be in the forest operating as mercenaries. So for that reason, I don't think this was the original intent of Ruka Devada when she constructed this wall. I do think the sandstorms and anti-deforestation makes a little sense, kinda, because you know how the Marana is associated with the memory of death, which is then associated with the sand, I, I kind of get it, but... More than anything else, it appears to just be a clear boundary line, but not one that possesses any real consequences if the wrong person crosses it. It's not like a you shall not pass kind of wall, you know what I mean? I get the feeling that the whole keeping people out thing might have been something later generations cooked up. However, beyond just the purpose of the wall in general, I find the name of the wall a little bit more interesting. Samuel is actually the name of an archangel from the Jewish Talmud, but despite serving God faithfully in most texts, he's sometimes called a fallen angel like Lucifer. His powers are dark and destructive, and it's better to think of him maybe more as like a necessary evil, as a lot of his destructive acts are done for the greater good. He's also sometimes called the angel of death, but of course that depends entirely on whether you're reading the Talmud or the Bible, but I digress. On a different note, Samuel is closely associated with the Demiurge in some Gnostic texts. He's considered the one who instructed the snake to tempt Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he is heavily associated with just snakes in general, and Genshin has a lot of questionable snake motifs, so I feel like that's noteworthy. And depending on the text, Samuel is one of the only entities that Asmodeus, the grand demon of hell, is subservient to, and in some instances, Asmodeus is Samuel's child. That probably doesn't feel relevant to most of you, so maybe now is a good time to remind you all that the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles codename is Asmode, which is a variation of the name Asmodeus. Now, I could actually go on for ages about Samuel, and I might in the future, but for this video, I just want to highlight how important I suspect this name is, or just might be, especially since in some texts, he's an angel who planted the Tree of Knowledge. It kind of makes you wonder, since his technology is advanced as hell, if he wasn't the one who created the original Akasha. For those of you wondering, yes, I am suggesting that Samuel is the demon name of the Scarlet King, and I will quickly explain my thoughts on this and how it relates to the Akasha, so bear with me. In the 3.0 Archon quests, Dia likens the Academia's dream harvesting via the Akasha to creating a hive mind or a giant brain. And wouldn't you know it, within the lines of the Lay of al Akmar are the words, Thus did the minds of millions merge into one, a lone soul that would eventually succumb to madness. This is the Golden Dream, as described within the Gilded Dreams artifact set, and it sounds suspiciously like what the Academia was trying to do with the whole Akasha Dream Loop thing now, doesn't it? So I gotta wonder, 
If the Akasha is powered by a dendro gnosis, which is all about trees and plants and stuff, obviously, because dendro, and Samuel planted the tree of knowledge, and the Scarlet King created a hive mind in his kingdom that mimics what we've seen the Akasha able to do, then doesn't that lay the foundation for the idea that the Scarlet King is Samuel and that he created a prototype Akasha system out of the countless minds of his people, which he dubbed the Golden Dream? In that case, I wonder if it's possible that the Scarlet King made the prototype system without any fail-safes, which is why it sucked everyone in. Ruka Devada might have thought that the technology was conceptually useful, but very dangerous in execution, so she might have used her Gnosis as some kind of security system, and then set it up so that she, only she could properly utilize the whole system. Basically, she was repurposing a very dangerous invention for the good of her people in the safest way possible. Lucky for her, it came preloaded with a million brains worth of information. Alternatively, Ruka Devada and the Scarlet King may have been working independently on two different versions of the same type of invention, and the Scarlet Kings failed while Ruka Devada succeeded. Yes, it's a bit of a messy theory, but it would help to explain why there's such an argument between the desert people and the people of the forest over who had the original title of God of Wisdom, right? And hey, speaking of the Scarlet King's questionable technology, I want to talk about this boss here, who I have dubbed Azimon, because that's the acronym you get from the full name. Now, on the one hand, you could look at this boss and go, oh, its name is A. Simon, and then look up Simon and find Simon Magus, one of the founders of Gnosticism, which is already suspicious because of Genshin's heavy Gnostic influences, but... If you look at the actual acronym, it says Algorithm of Semi-Intransient Matrix of Overseer Network. A. Simon, or Azimon. However, if you were to, I don't know, create a more advanced version of such a matrix and were therefore able to remove the semi from the title, you might add another descriptor to the beginning and get something like, um, Primordial Algorithm of Intransient Matrix of Overseer Network. In other words, P-A-I-M-O-N. Not to be confused with Paimon. You see, these are two different things. P-A-I-M-O-N is this automatic system that sends us goodies in our in-game email, right? But when our traveling companion, Paimon, sends us email, she spells it differently. So that got me thinking. What if Paimon isn't really Paimon's name? What if Paimon is really a regular Seelie that survived under the water for maybe thousands of years, and when she was fished back up, the first thing she remembered was P-A-I-M-O-N, so she used that in place of her name. Seelies were meant to teach the savage human race, after all, and to travel with them and guide them, right? Well, if all the Seelies were able to link up to P-A-I-M-O-N, like the humans link up to the Akasha, well... What is it? What is it? <gasps> is it another Paimon? And you know how we kind of like to talk about this whole Seelies were cursed to never fall in love thing, right? Well, what if the curse was less a curse and more of just a repercussion? If a Seelie fell in love with a human, then maybe that severed their connection to P-A-I-M-O-N, and they therefore lost their intelligence and their vitality over time until they withered away into nothing. After all, the Aranara says that everything returns to Sarva. Well, Sarva means something like the whole or the everything, which might actually make it a pun in English because you could do Sarva, Serva, Server? Would that just make P-A-I-M-O-N a cloud server in Paimon a terminal like Kusanali? I admit that's kind of crack, but like what if, right? What if? Okay, shifting gears a bit. You know how I mentioned Samuel is the Angel of Death? Well, turns out that's super fitting because Aru Village is named after another Death God's realm. Aru literally means Field of Reeds, and this was the name of the land that Osiris ruled over. The Field of Reeds was kind of like heaven in the sense that if the deceased could reach it, they would have a very, very pleasant afterlife. Now, if Sinnoh is from this village, which I think he is, then it's twice as fitting that he has so many Anubis references since he was also a god of the dead, albeit fulfilling a bit of a different role than Osiris was. Now, this village apparently harbors exiled researchers from the academia, and Dottore was very likely among them. In the Pale Flame set, it's mentioned that Piero found Dottori in the desert, after all, and it is a perfect place to study for someone so fascinated with ancient technology, because, you know, the place is full of the Scarlet King's old techno-babbly-boobloos. 
In fact, if the Akasha really was created in the desert, it would set Dottori up perfectly for his current situation where he's able to experiment with it directly. He seems to have found out how Kusanali's possession ability works and is actively manipulating people connected to the Akasha. In fact, he seems to be kind of forcing them into a state of worship. Now, Venti did mention way back at the beginning of the game that a god's power is directly connected to the worship of its people. So if Tatori is putting people into a state of adoration or worship, and he's also creating a fake god out of Scaramouche, then this might be a way to power the little gremlin up. And we'll get to Scaramouche in a minute, I promise, but before that... If it is the case that Dottori's figured out Kusanali's little possession trick, he's likely managed to hijack control over the Akasha itself. That means Kusanali might have to go into literal hiding, and the only place she can really hide is within Catherine. Kusanali only ever hijacks Catherine's body because she's a bionic puppet, and she, quote, respects her people's free will too much to possess their bodies. But I think Dottori knows this and has convinced some Eremites to hunt her down under false accusations, which means Kusanali is probably going to take some serious damage here when she gets stabbed. So the real question is, is Scaramouche attempting to take her place by powering the Akasha with the Electronosis instead of the Dendronosis? Because that'd be kind of crazy. The little gremlin is trying to ascend to godhood, after all, and maybe Sumeru is his trial run before he tries to take over Inazuma, although I kinda doubt he'll get that far. Speaking of my squishy little mecha munchkin, he finally got himself a new mechanical god bod, which is hilarious. However, I want to revisit this whole godhood idea. Scaramouche was an attempt at creating a whole-ass god, right? But despite being artificial, you gotta wonder if he ever actually had a demon name. After all, we don't really know where those names come from. But if I had to pick a name for him, I'd say he's probably a Belial. Whether they decide to call him that in-game or not, I don't really care. But see, if Makoto is Ball and A is Balzibul, then we need to follow the Ball trend at least, right? That leaves Balith, Balam, or Belial. The thing is, the name Belial is just too perfect for him because the name itself means worthless or he who will never wake, which fits him to a T. The Pale Flame says he was cast away like worthless dross, and A had left him to sleep in the Shakai Pavilion forever, never intending for him to ever wake up, right? And in a complete 180, Belial is heralded as a champion of humanity in the Satanic Bible. I kind of wonder if they'll go with that characterization for him at some point, because that would be hilarious. And as much as I want to fawn over my favorite little problematic gremlin, I actually want to draw your attention to these purple tubes that are connected to him. See, these tubes are not just decorations on the sides, they are also these strange tubes full of a strange purple liquid that are connected to Scaramouche through his spine, which is directly linking him to the mecha, right? These tubes of liquid are usually associated with Dottori, at least by me. All of his clones have these small syringes full of an eerie blue liquid hanging from his ears, so I just kind of naturally link the two together. But then Sumeru gave us Alhatham, who also has this tube of eerie liquid, at least it kind of looks like that to me, connected to his ears through his headpiece. And now I'm wondering if this liquid is kind of like leyline fluid. Like someone drew memories from the ley lines and converted them into a fluid form for easy storage and use. I was thinking of this because, like, we know Dottori makes clones of himself, right? So what if he literally extracted the memory of himself from the ley lines and used that to create little clones of himself that he gives pieces of that memory to? Now, Alhatham may be doing something kind of similar, connecting his headgear to a canister that's tucked back into his clothing. And that might be why Scaramouche has similar tubes plugged into his back. He might be using this ley line fluid as a conduit for the Gnosis and or to power the mech. I don't really know where I'm going with this idea, but just like make note of it anyway, because I think it might come up. Maybe not in the way I presented it, but you, you, you get the idea. And now we can talk about all the tiny little things that piqued my interest, but I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time on. Starting with our newest character, Mika, who appears to be bringing us lore on Grand Master Varka of all people. Bless him, cause really, we've heard nothing about this dude for literally years. Mika is part of Eula's division, which explains why their uniforms are similar, but beyond that, I don't have a whole lot to say about him other than, good on you kid, bring us more Varka letters. The free spear is Mondstadt themed, which is 
Kind of weird when you think about it, because Mondstadt has an odd relationship with spears as they're considered the weapon of the lower class and sometimes the weapon of traitors. So far, the only spear user in Mondstadt is Rosaria, and she came from a bandit group originally, so there's that. I cannot wait to read its lore. Now this festival also seems to be bringing us lore about Razor and his parents, which I was not expecting at all, and it feels very suspicious since it's happening in the same patch that we're getting a brand new character in, which also happens to be an electro dog boy with white hair and red eyes, just like Razor. Coincidence? I don't know. It's weird. I also really loved that they did this little recap of the story so far. It's just a really cool thing to do, especially since they're keeping Enjo. I love Enjo and I have a theory about him that I'll share in another video, but I am glad to see he'll be a recurring character. Really glad, really glad. He's so full of flavor. First thing of note is that Enjo corrects himself when he accidentally calls Aether Lumine's brother. This implies one of two things. Either Lumine does not actively recognize Aether as her sibling anymore, or there's someone in the Abyss Order who doesn't agree with her association with him. I'm kind of leaning towards the latter because she asks Enjo to, quote, add her words to his report, which implies that she is not the final recipient of said report. The report is being made to someone else, likely someone above her. To me, this is evidence that there may in fact be a proper Abyss King or Queen and that the Abyss Twin is not the leader of the Abyss Order at all. Now obviously that's not everything that was in this trailer, but I'm gonna leave it here for now. I gotta get this finished before the patch drops after all. Anyway, thanks a ton for watching, I am so ready for the desert, let's go, bye!